We're beginning a, a new series of sermons that I'm, I'm excited about. It's called The Comeback. It's not too late. You're never too far. I've entitled our first message in the series, From Liar to Leader. Dave was born to an average family in rural Tennessee in 1960. He was uh, pretty intelligent, he was driven, and he, he, he just had this, this consuming desire to have more and to be more than the situation that he grew up in. In 1982, he graduated from the University of Tennessee from the College of Business. He had a degree in business administration with a specialty in real estate and in finance. After graduating, he went out to uh, fulfill his dream and he did. Within a few years, he built a multi-million dollar real estate empire. He and his wife had life by the tail. Life was great. They had a couple kids. And um, they were just living high. Money for anything they wanted to do. Seemed like he was a great success. But then, everything began to fall apart. He'd leveraged himself too much, too much debt, and within months, he found himself sitting with his wife at a table in their home that they were about to lose. He'd lost everything in his business. He was sitting with his wife around a table and two chairs, one of the few pieces of furniture. I think they had their beds left, but one of the few pieces of furniture they had left in their home as they struggled to keep a roof over their heads going through bankruptcy. Now, for a guy who's been to the top and, and who has created a multi-million dollar empire, for any guy, that kind of failure is terrible. I mean, it's a place of shame. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of, how do I even hold my head up? No more respect. It's a place of inadequacy. But you know, Dave learned from his mistakes... He began to do things God's way, and now he has a new firm. It's called Ramsey Solutions. It focuses on giving people solid biblical financial advice. And today, the new firm that he formed, coming back from that terrible crash, is worth over $55 million and is changing lives around the world. No debt whatsoever. Have you ever found yourself in a place of shame, a place of humiliation, a, a place of darkness, a place of failure after, after you'd been a great success and seemed like things were going great? Have you ever been in a place where you just wish that you could sort of disappear so that you didn't have to face people and answer questions and deal with the shame, the guilt? It's a dark place to be. Maybe, maybe you weren't honest in your career and it finally caught up with you and, and you lost a good job, a respectable job and a, and a good income. Maybe you haven't been or you weren't honest in your marriage or maybe you're not being honest in your marriage right now and maybe your spouse knows about it, maybe they don't know about it, but you feel dirty and you're ashamed and and you'd like to get out of the mess but you don't even know how to begin and maybe you haven't done a very good job of raising your kids or spending the time with them that you know you should have and now your kids are a mess and their lives are being wasted and and you carry a lot of guilt you carry a lot of regrets is it too late for you have you gone too far? You know, when you look at what God is doing in the Bible, God is just writing comeback story after comeback story. He's a God who does that, and that's why we're doing this series, because you are never too far gone, and it's never too late for you. That's why we're doing this. In fact, I'd like you to keep three simple phrases in mind as we go through this series over the next several weeks. 
And it, they're going to be in your sermon notes and you can take note of them because I think they're great phrases to remember. First of all, everybody's welcome. Say it with me. Everybody's welcome. You see, God created you. You are made in the image of God. That means you have value. That means you matter. And you know, when Jesus came to this earth, people were pretty confused about who mattered and who was important and who wasn't. And Jesus showed us that all are welcome in His presence. And so I want you to know, no matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done, everybody's welcome here. Everybody's welcome. Second of all, nobody's perfect. Say that with me. Nobody's perfect. Turn to your neighbor and look at them and say, I'm not perfect. Do it right now, okay? Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not perfect. And then say back to them, that's okay, we already knew. <laughs> yeah, none of us are perfect. It's really true. Now, now, we say we're not perfect, not as an excuse. Hear that. This is not an excuse, but it's simply a way to explain how we got to where we are and, and, and what's happening and what God's going to do from here. Now, recognizing that we're not perfect means that we don't have to pretend. You see, God loves you where you are, not where you pretend to be. God loves you where you are, not where you pretend to be. And, and so in order to get on with your life, you have to put an ending to pretending. Third, anything's possible. And say it with me. Anything's possible. You see, we serve a God and we believe in a God who is the master of comebacks and turnarounds. You're not too far and it's not too late because, you know, in order to have a comeback, you have to have a setback. And we've all had setbacks. And, and some of them are behind us and some of them were right in the middle of them right now. And so my question is, is it too late for you? Are you too far gone? What does God have to say about that? Let's bow our heads together for a moment. Dear God, as we begin this next series of messages, God, I just know that you want to bring incredible hope to all of us imperfect, broken people. People who have had great opportunities and who have squandered them. People that have made messes and maybe find ourselves still in those messes, still living through the consequences. Lord, would you just help us see that in your word you're writing comeback stories? And would you help us see that those stories are not just about people a couple thousand years ago, but that your word is relevant to our life today and it holds answers and meaning and direction and hope right now, right here in Richardson in 2018. And so we give you this time and we trust you to do something awesome, God. In Jesus' name I pray and thank you. Amen. If you're with us via internet, we welcome you. Thanks for tuning in today. Open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25. We begin our comeback uh, series with the story of Jacob. And as we look at it, I, I, I want you to see how we get set up to mess up. Genesis 5, starting in verse 21. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah his wife conceived. But the children struggled together within her and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. 
Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. I'm going to stop there for a moment. You know, I don't know if you noticed it as we read this, but things don't start out very well in this family, do they? I mean, right in the womb, these brothers are fighting. They can't get along even in the womb. They're twins. Twins are supposed to be like total kindred spirits, right? And they're fighting right there in the womb. The second one, and when they're born, they've already got issues. When they're born, the second one, you know, he's already grabbing the heel of the one that's coming out first, you know, trying to pull him back, trying to get ahead, whatever the case. And that's why they called him Jacob, a name that means deceitful. From the womb, Jacob is trying to get ahead of Esau. And to top it off, he's given a name that brands him. Think about it. If I were called deceitful, if that's what I had to answer to every day, you think about that. Hey, deceitful. I mean, my self-confidence would be in the toilet. I, I don't know about you, but I couldn't deal with that. And so here's this guy, and this is his name. And, and so... Where did he get that from and, and what's going on? One of the things I want to point out, if you look at the bigger picture of this story, when we think about setups for mess ups, generational sins can set us up for failure. Why do I say that? Well, what do you know about Abraham? Did Abraham have a certain problem? Yeah, what was that problem? Lying. Abraham was a liar. His son Isaac, guess what? Isaac has the same problem. He's a liar too. Same lie as his dad. She's not my wife. She's my sister. Same thing. Now Jacob comes along and, and there's this family history that's set up against him to set him up for failure. Now second of all, another insight that I think we find here in Scripture is this, that Family of origin dysfunction can set us up for failure. The Bible says, you read it with me, that Isaac loved who? Esau, you see. Now, sure, Rebekah loved Jacob, but every child needs to be noticed and valued and loved by their father. Isn't that right? Especially sons. And, and so reading between the lines, Isaac loved Esau. Esau was his favorite. And so here's poor Jacob. And, and Jacob is growing up with this hole in his heart. He's feeling insecure. He's always feeling not quite good enough, not quite noticed, not quite loved. Maybe that's why he lusted after. Maybe that's why he coveted the birthright blessing. Let's keep going. Verse 29. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now when we read these verses, we always look at Esau and we go, what on earth, this guy, how could he sell his birthright away for a bowl of soup? Esau, and we really land hard on Esau. But did you ever think about this from the other side, from the side of Jacob? I mean, this is kind of interesting when you stop to meditate on this. Esau comes in from the wilderness. He's been out there hunting, doing something, whatever the case. But he's worn out. He's weary. He's starving. I mean, he's probably weak from his hunger. And Jacob has prepared this delicious food. I mean, mouth-watering. It's just great stuff. 
Now, they're brothers. They're brothers. Not just that, they're what? Twins. So, why didn't Jacob say, Oh, Esau, help yourself. Get refreshed and get some new strength. I'm so glad I have this ready for you. Here, have, have all you want. Why doesn't Jacob do that? I mean, look what he's doing, right? Huh. No way. Sell me your birthright. You see, Jacob, instead of sharing with him gladly as his brother, no, he's been coveting the birthright, and now he sees a chance to take advantage of Esau at a vulnerable moment and use it for his own selfish gain. Insight number three, our own choices can set us up for failure. And so Jacob says, you can't have any soup until you promise to sell me your birthright. You see, Jacob chooses to unleash the deceit. He chooses to unleash the deceit. Esau succumbs, and Jacob gets what he wants the wrong way, and he starts down a road of heartache and shame. Can you relate to this situation that we're seeing here in Scripture? This is a setup for a mess up, isn't it? Maybe there's some generational sins in, in your family. Some stuff that goes back, granddad, dad, maybe great-granddad, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you've got a, history fa a family history that's stacked against you. Maybe it's deceit like Jacob, I don't know. Maybe it's infidelity. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's covetousness but it's led you on a road of heartache and shame. Maybe there's dysfunction in your family of origin that's, that's left a hole in your heart. And maybe you're, you're not even really conscious of it, but somehow you've been trying to meet that need and fill that emptiness all the wrong ways, and you've made a lot of bad choices around that, and you're on a road of heartache and shame, and you're broken and dirty and feeling like a failure. See, this is how we get set up for a mess up. But let's turn our Bibles to Genesis 27. The story doesn't end there. That's the setup. But unfortunately, the setup leads to a setback. Genesis 27, verse 1. A train of events is put in motion that leads to pain and shame and guilt that Jacob never ever thought about when he made that choice, those early choices. Verse 1, reading down to verse 10. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son. And he answered him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out in the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food, such as I love, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me some game and make savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the field and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats and I will make savory food from them for your father such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that, you know, he's blind, he can't tell who's coming, that you may eat of it, that he may bless you before his death. So now the deceit that was unleashed really begins to ramp up. Rebekah pulls Jacob into the plot to trick Esau into giving him the birthright blessing that he wants to give to Esau. And so i got to say something. Watch out for other people and how they will influence you. Right? 
We've got to learn to think independently. We've got to learn to be our own people and let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and not everybody around us. Because here's the lesson we learn, first of all, in this situation. Others' negative influence is always deadly. Rebecca persuades Jacob to trick his dad. Now, I don't know if Jacob didn't really want to do it, but he was swayed by his mother. Or I don't know if he was right on board or if he was analyzing the weaknesses in their plan so that they wouldn't fail. But if you keep reading, I, I won't do it right now, but if you keep reading, he basically says, look, Esau's really hairy. And I know dad can't see. And when I go in there, he's going to want to feel me. And then I'm going to get caught. And so Rebecca says, well, you know what? We can solve that. We'll cover the exposed areas with some goat skins and, and, and you'll be okay. He won't figure it out. Now I have to stop right here. Esau must have been really hairy. I, I mean, if Isaac is not going to tell the difference between Esau's skin and a goat's pelt. Oh, man. Maybe he was the missing link. I, I don't know, but... He was so hairy. So, so look what happens. Verse 18. So, so Jacob does all this. He goes along with this. And then it, talking about Jacob, says, So he went into his father and said, My father. And Isaac, he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise and sit and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? See, Isaac is smelling something. The voice doesn't sound quite right. The time doesn't quite right. And he said, this is what Jacob says, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near, that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Goatskin. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. I don't know if you see what's going on here or if you're catching the point of this, but the next lesson here in the story is this. A lie always takes you deeper than you meant to go. I mean, look at how it starts. Probably Jacob went in there hoping, you know what, I just don't want to say anything. I, I just hope this goes smoothly and I don't even have to say anything. But no, of course you're going to, Isaac is going to ask, and, and, and the more questions, the more lies. And, you know, who, who are you? Well, I'm, I'm Esau. Well, how'd you get here so quickly? Well, God worked a miracle. Well, I, I'm not convinced. I, I want to feel you. Jacob presents the goat skins. Are you really Esau? Of course I am. Isaac is finally convinced. He gives Jacob the birthright blessing. Hey, I hate to say this, but here's another lesson. Deceit often brings short-term success. Right? Jacob got what he was after. He got the birthright blessing. He got what he was lusting after. He pulled off the heist of all heists in that culture. Because you see, he impersonates his brother successfully and gains the birthright blessing, the double portion of his father's wealth. And it didn't stop just there. He got all the status. He got all the position. He got all the influence. That was the birthright blessing. The firstborn kind of got, you know, he got the, the wad. So Jacob pulls it off and he gets what he's after. Family, position, power. Maybe some of us here today are struggling with this issue of deceitfulness. And we're, we've not been living an honest life. And, and maybe we've actually been successful with it. Maybe we've gotten things that we wanted. It's helped you gain what you wanted. Maybe it hasn't caught up with you yet. But you know what happens in this story, don't you? If you read verses 30 and following, 
Isaac and Esau get together and they put two and two together and they figure out exactly what happens. You know that this is the next thing. Your deceit will always be exposed. You see, at some point, the altered reality that you have created is going to crumble. And it's going to mess up really bad. You're going to have that setback of all setbacks because lies can never stand the truth. And by the way, that's the nature of sin anyway, right? Gives you, it sucks you in with a little success, gets you hooked, makes you feel good until you're hooked, and then it dumps you, turns on you, betrays you. In Jacob's story, Esau gets into a murderous rage, and here's the irony. Jacob, who deceived so that he could get a double portion of the wealth, he has to flee home with what? Nothing. Nada. Now, lesson number five, and this is key. I want you to get this. The pain you reap far exceeds the gain you seek. The pain you reap far exceeds the gain you seek. I don't have time to read it, so I'm going to tell you how the story goes over the next few chapters. Jacob flees from home, alone, guilty, shamed, feeling hopeless, because not only is he estranged from his family, he also he's feeling like he's estranged from God. He's sure about that. By the way, he and his mother were really close. We saw the Bible said, Rebecca, you know what? Jacob never saw his mother again. He arrives at his uncle. His uncle lets him move in and stay and help him out in the family business. He falls in love with Rachel. Uncle says, yeah, you can marry her after you work for me seven years. You can marry Rachel. And guess what? On his wedding night, he's deceived. Oh, the chickens come back to roost, don't they? <laughs> and he marries Leah instead of Rachel. That must have been a weird deal. You wake up in the morning and you're not with the woman you thought you married? Oh, man. That just trips my mind right out right there. And, and so, so Laban says, oh, but you know what? We'll solve this. You, you work for me another seven years and now I'll give you the one you really wanted in the first place. And so Jacob's in for another seven years. And then when he's done that, he's, and Laban's like, well, no, don't leave. You, you're really a blessing to my business. You know, I'm getting wealthy because of you. So let me pay you some wages now. So he starts paying Jacob wages. But you know what he does? He changes them ten times. He keeps tricking him and deceiving him. And, and, and then, you know, Jacob, as he's getting the wages, his wealth begins to grow. And, and, and as that happens, Happens. Laban's sons get jealous of him and, and, and they begin to have really harmful ideas for him and they're plotting about how to bring him down. And so Jacob has to sneak away from his family with his family. How messed up is that? It's terrible. The book Patriarchs and Prophets, talking about the story, tells us that in one short hour, Jacob made a lifetime of consequences. This is a big mess up. This is a setback. The pain you reap far exceeds the gain you seek. But don't jump off the cliff just yet, okay? Don't do that. Because at Jacob's darkest hour, when he is fleeing without a friend in the world, you know what God does, don't you? God shows up to him in a dream. He shows him that ladder between heaven and earth showing there is a connection. There is a bridge back for you. And God speaks to him. He says, God here, Jacob, deceiver, I am with you. I'm still with you. You don't feel it, but I'm with you. I'm going to bless you and prosper you, and I'm going to bring you back to your home again. In the middle of his mess, God does that for Jacob. This is what he does for Jacob. He confirms his mercy even in our mess. Praise God for that, church. He confirms His mercy even in our mess. And His words to Jacob are His words for you here today if you're in the middle of a mess and you're not sure there's a way back out of it. God's saying to you, I am with you. 
I am going to bless you. I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to bring you home again. Well, enough of the setups and the setbacks. Let's get to what we came to hear, right? The comeback. Let's go to Genesis 31. I would like to begin talking about the comeback with you now. Genesis 31 and verse 3 is where we'll, we'll jump back into the story. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. Down to verse 17. Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels, and he carried away all, the li all his livestock and his possessions which he had gained, his acquired livestock which he had gained in Paddan Aram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. You see, what's interesting is Jacob had lived for 20 years in his mess up. Not a day went by, but he didn't think about that day so long ago when he deceived his dad. You talk about beating yourself up. You talk about feeling like you've gone too far. You talk about feeling like it's too late. Jacob knew that the stuff that he was going through, he knew this like he knew his own face. I mean, it was so familiar, he, he couldn't escape it. But what did we read here? It says that God told him to go home. In other words, it's time for your comeback, Jacob. What should we know here? First lesson about comebacks is this. God has a plan to restore us. God watched over Jacob tenderly during all those long years of living in the setback, living in the mess up. And he came to Jacob and he said, Jacob, I want to write a new chapter in this story. I'm going to restore you. It's time to move on. Let's get up and let's come home. If you're feeling like you can relate to Jacob, God wants you to grasp this. He's ready to write a new chapter in your story. He's ready to write the comeback chapter with you. And so Jacob begins the comeback. He begins heading for home. And you can read the story yourself this afternoon when you get home. But as he heads for home, this doesn't just, you know, go easy and smooth. He heads for home. Laban finds out he's gone. He comes with an army to force him to stay. Well, God, and Jacob doesn't have an army, so, you know, he's really, really at, at risk. But God helps him get through that, takes care of him, protects him, and so he's carrying on his journey. He barely breathes that sigh of relief when he gets news that Esau is on his way to meet him with a welcoming committee. 400 armed and angry men ready to take him down. You see, Esau, 20 years, you think, oh man, you know, 20 years. Forget, you know, it's all, all gone, forgotten, it's all in the past. No, no, Esau hasn't forgotten about that birthright theft. In fact, he's been nursing the grudge for 20 years. And now he is ready for some revenge. I'm going to get my revenge. And he's on his way. Jacob, well, what can I do? Maybe I can buy some peace. So he puts together this massive gift and he sends it on ahead to try to make peace with Esau, but Esau's having none of it. He doesn't care. That gift doesn't mean a thing to him. He wants his revenge. And so then uh, he divides his, his caravan up into two groups, hoping that if, if one falls prey to Esau, at least the other one's going to escape. And, and then he goes off by himself to pray. And as he's praying there, he gets attacked by an unknown foe and he begins to wrestle for his life. What's my point in going through all that? Well, here's my point. Comebacks are not easy. If you just think coming back is just no effort at all, think again. This was a rough road for Jacob. There, there were doubts along the way. There, there were obstacles. There, there was some tough stuff that, that was there. But don't let that stop you. When obstacles in, the, in your comeback story arise, don't get discouraged by them. Be stubborn about your comeback. Why? Because God is with us in our darkest hour. That unknown foe that Jacob thought he was wrestling to save his life, he thought this was his enemy. It's Jesus Christ. 
pre-incarnation. God is with us right there in our darkest hour, just when it seems like there's no hope and no use. Jesus was there with Jacob. Let's pick it up in verse 24 of chapter 32. 32, 24, Genesis. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He finally realized he wasn't wrestling with flesh and blood. He finally realized he was wrestling with his Savior, with his Redeemer, with the God that could take care of him and do something for him. He said, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me me so he said what is your name oh don't ask me that don't go there God but you see God has to go there God has to go into our pain he has to go into our shame and I'm really proud of Jacob because in this moment he faced it God asks him, what's your name? And he says, Jacob, deceitful. He admitted it. He owned it. He repented of it. Verse 28, and he, God said, Jesus said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but... Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. When I read this part of the story, I get get chills. I get shivers running up and down my spine because... Here's, this is an incredible comeback. Jacob, all his life, the deceitful. Living with that, living with that cloud hanging over him, deceitful. And when he faces his demons and when he admits it and when he acknowledges it and repents of it and turns away from it, wrestles with God, God does something. God gives him a new name. He says, no, 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 you're not Jacob anymore. You're Israel, Prince of God. What a comeback. And and, and so what happens here is that God forgives him and honors him. He changes his name. He blesses him again. He changed Esau's heart so that instead of wiping him out when they met, Esau comes up and embraces him, and there is peace in the family. That's what God does for every comeback story that he writes. He forgives us and He honors us. I think that this is really the place where Jacob became the leader of the covenant people and the covenant promises because he became Israel. This is the first place you find the word Israel anywhere in the Bible, right here, where he wrestles with God and God changes His name because He gave him victory over his past, over his mess up, over his setback. All those 20 long years that Jacob thought he was just living through the consequences of his choices, I want you to know something. God wasn't wasting that time. God wasn't wasting it. He was using it to prepare Jacob for something better than he imagined. God wasn't wasting those 20 years. God was using them to change Jacob from being a liar into a leader. He was engineering Jacob's comeback, and Jacob might not have even known it, and you might not even know it, but God can use the circumstances you're going through, messy as they are, to engineer your comeback. You might carry a lot of shame. You might carry a lot of guilt over whatever your mess up is. You might feel like it's so purposeless and whatever. But I want you to know, God is not wasting it. God uses that very stuff to prepare us for something better than we imagined. 
You're going to come back from whatever your mess up was and you're going to come back better and you're going to come back wiser and you're going to come back stronger and you're going to come back more dependent on God. I think God gave us the story because this is a guy who allowed deceit and desire, lust, to take him down. And we start with this comeback story because we're going we're, we're gonna to look at a number of different Bible characters in, in, in the course of this series. And all of them are going to teach us about different mistakes, different mess-ups that we make. And maybe, maybe this isn't where you're at today, but maybe someone's here that's got an issue and is messing up because of deceit and desire, just like Jacob. And what I want you to hear today is that God can write a comeback story for you. Jacob came back from that terrible setback, and God gave him a wonderful, wonderful outcome, a wonderful future. God used him to be the next step in God's plan to save the entire world. And I want you to know, if deceit and desire are taking you down right now, God can deliver you. You're not too far. And it's not too late. And this is a guy, Jacob was a guy that would have said, it's too late for me. I'm too far gone. Look at what I've done. Because after, Sa- after he messed up, do you, do you think Satan just left him alone and said, oh, I'm going to let God go in there and give him some love and some encouragement? Oh, no, I think Satan jumped all over that, don't you? I think Satan pulled up right beside him and sat on his shoulder and starts discouraging him and putting darkness there and just beating him up. And he makes Jacob think that he's lost God's favor forever. He makes him feel like an outcast and he finds no relief for his tortured heart and and his dark feelings. Jacob isn't even sure that he can pray to God anymore and he fears that God is done with him. It was dark. Some of you here today may feel that way too. That you've gone too far and it's too late. And so God gave us this story to say there's no setback, there's no mess up that puts you outside the limit of my grace. No setback that puts you outside the limit. There is no one who's too far gone. I want to share a wonderful quote with you here from the book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. God would not have us remain pressed down by dumb sorrow with sore and breaking hearts. He would have us look up and behold His dear face of love. He longs to clasp our hands and to have us look to Him in simple faith, permitting Him to guide us. His heart is open to our griefs, our sorrows, and our trials. He has loved us with a what kind of love? everlasting love and with loving kindness compassed us about he will lift the soul above the daily sorrow and perplexity into a realm of peace isn't that beautiful you see God gave us this story so that we can believe anything's possible He gave us this story to let us know that He never writes anybody off. Instead, He writes a new chapter. He writes a new story. He writes a new ending. Dear one, whomever you may be, may be suffering through deceit and desire, God says to you, you've not gone too far. But you say, well, you don't know what I've done, Pastor. You know what? I don't need to know what you've done. Because you know what? Jesus already knows all about it. He already knows all about it. And you know what? He says, it's not too late for you. I know every detail of your mess. And guess what? I love you. I love you. Even more, I died for all that. All that mess up, all that stuff you think is too bad, all that stuff you think can't be forgiven, can't be overcome, I died for all of that. And I took it to the cross. And I nailed it there so that you could have a comeback. 
That's what my grace is all about in your life. That's what Jesus is saying to you today. He's saying, uh, uh, you haven't gone too far. I can forgive you if you'll ask me. I can turn your life around if you'll let me. I, I want to do this for you. That's why I bore all the pain. That's why I bore all the shame. That's why I paid all the price and went to that cross. And that's why I rose from the grave. Because I handled it. And I had the biggest comeback. And my comeback can be your comeback. You can have a comeback. I turn losers into winners, Jesus says. I turn liars into leaders, Jesus says. I'm the master of comebacks. It's what I do. And I want to do it for you. Will you let him? Will you let him? Will you let Jesus do that for you today? I wrap up inviting you to this step, this commitment today. Why don't we all just stop believing Satan's lies that we can't come back and start believing that God will forgive us and restore us. Let's do it, church. Let's let's allow God to write a comeback story in our lives.